Hi! I'm currently working on an assembler for the Game Boy and also streaming the whole process live on Twitch. And every now and then I get asked the question, what is an assembler? And that made me realize that in the current software climate, it is not really that common to know what an assembler is or what it does. So I thought I'd try to answer this question in this video. Now I could just give you the Wikipedia rundown of what an assembler is and what it does, but that is not my style. I'm going to start with some lower level concepts first, so you can exactly see what kind of problems an assembler and the assembly programming language are trying to solve. So let me start with the central processing unit of a computer, the CPU for short. The CPU is a chip at the center of every modern computing device and is able to do various things for us. It can perform basic mathematical operations, it can read data from memory and also write data back to memory. It can send and receive information from other chips in the machine, for example a graphics card or a network adapter. But a CPU doesn't do any of these things willy-nilly. It needs to be told what to do and when to do it. And this can be achieved with CPU instructions that are defined by the chip designers. Each chip comes with its own set of instructions that it is able to understand. Sometimes CPUs share the same instruction set architecture, meaning they're all based on the exact same set of instructions. Think of AMD versus Intel. Both of these CPUs are based on the x86-64 instruction set architecture and generally understand the same set of instructions while ARM64 based chips are based on a completely different set of instructions. An instruction could be something like adding two numbers together and putting the result into a specific location in memory. Or it could be a conditional instruction that does different things depending on the state of the input. Some instructions might even do more than one thing. For example, adding a set of numbers with another set of numbers all in one go, instead of having to do one addition at a time. What exactly those instructions are is not really important. We just have to know that CPU instructions are the interface a programmer has to use to tell the CPU what to do. A CPU is receiving these instructions from the system memory where they are all laid out in sequence. For example, this fictional CPU right here is fetching one instruction from the system memory and doing whatever it is instructed to do. Once it is done, it will go ahead and fetch the next instruction from memory so it then knows what to do next. This process is repeated many times per second based on the clock speed of the chip. So if our fictional CPU is operating on a clock speed of 1 GHz, it would mean that it can execute 1 billion instructions per second. That is, if one instruction only takes one cycle to execute. Some instructions might take more than one cycle. Modern CPUs usually have a lot of tricks up their sleeves to mitigate the effects of instructions that take more than one cycle, but that is way off topic for now. Each CPU instruction is encoded in a bit pattern. So let's assume our fictional CPU here has 256 different instructions it understands. To encode all 256 instructions in a bit pattern, we would need 8 bits of data. So let's assume we have the following instructions. 136 to load a number into the CPU. 12 to decrement the number in the CPU by 1. 48 for conditional that checks if the number in memory is 0. And if it is not 0, then it jumps back a given number of instructions. And then 0, which stops the CPU from executing any more instructions. With these instructions, we can now write a simple program. First, let's load the number 5 into the CPU. This can be done with the load instruction 136 followed by the number 5. Then we decrement that number by 1 with the decrement instruction 12. We then check if the number has reached 0 and if it has not, we jump back to the previous instruction. So this will be done with 48 followed by a 1 to indicate that we want to jump back one instruction. If the number has reached zero, we would like to stop execution, which means we can add the stop instruction zero right after the conditional check. So this is our basic program. If we were to run it, the CPU would fetch the first instruction and load the number five. It would then decrement it by one, resulting in a four. It then checks if the number has reached zero, which it hasn't, so it jumps back by one instruction, meaning the CPU now executes the decrement instruction again, which results in the number three. The zero check is done again, which would bring the CPU back to the decrement instruction. This process is repeated until the number eventually reaches zero, which means the CPU is no longer jumping back by one instruction. Instead, the next instruction is executed, which is just the stop instruction, which Job stops done. the CPU from doing anything else. As you can see, a simple program like this that is just decrementing a number until it reaches zero does already look very cryptic. 
It is just a bunch of numbers thrown together that carry a certain meaning, and as a programmer you would have to remember all of it. Programs can also grow quickly in size, and you can imagine just having a file with hundreds or thousands of numbers is not only hard to read and write, but also difficult to maintain and debug. This is where the assembly programming language comes in. It associates a short human readable monomic to each of the CPU instruction numbers. So in our case, the load instruction 136 could be named LD for load. Decrement number 12 could be named DEC. The conditional operator 48 could be named JBNZ for jump back when non-zero. And the stop instruction 0 could be named stop. So our program in assembly language would look something like this. This makes it already much more readable. The monomics usually are called the operations and the values following them, such as the 5 and 1 in our program, are the operands of an operation. Both together form the instruction. Depending on the assembly language syntax and the CPU architecture, an operation can be followed by one or more operands. This is because some operations can share the same name but have different kinds of operands. Consider Consider the LD operation for example. The CPU could have two distinctive instructions to load a number into the CPU memory. One is for a given number, like the 5 that we loaded before, and the other is for a number that is stored in a known memory location, let's say X. Both of these have distinct bit encodings, but in assembly they could be expressed with the same shorthand as they perform the same load operation in principle, just from a different source. So LD followed by a 5 as an operand would result in the CPU instruction 136, while the LD followed by a known memory location X would result in the CPU instruction 130, for example. The operation shorthands are traditionally a few characters long, because back in the day machines didn't have a lot of memory available. Available. So the assembly code needed to be as small as possible without being at risk to lose meaning. So jump became JP, load became LD, and so on. Nowadays there is no real reason to keep these operation names so short, as modern machines have gigabytes of memory available to them. The textual representation of our program is not something the CPU can understand. Instead we need a program that is able to take this assembly code and transform it into the bit encoded CPU instructions that the machine understands. This is the job of the assembler. An assembler takes a text file that contains assembly code, parses it line by line, and spits out the corresponding bit encoded instructions that the CPU can read and execute. So far so good. We have now eliminated the need to write programs in bytecode and instead are able to write it in human readable text, which is excellent. However, there are a few more things that an assembler can help with to make it easier to write programs for a CPU. Let's take a look at the jump back when not zero instruction. At the moment, it takes one operand that is the number of instructions we want to jump backwards. So in our case, just one instruction, as indicated by the number one. But what if our program now changes and we want to add two more instructions after the decrement? It doesn't really matter what those instructions are, but just imagine we are instructing the CPU to do a little bit more work after the decrement before we check if the number is zero. Now our jump instruction still jumps back only one instruction, which means it no longer jumps to the decrement, but instead to one of the newly added instructions. This now breaks our program, as we no longer decrement the number by one. We would now have to manually adjust the number of jumps from one to three. In this example, it might be easy to keep track of it and count the numbers of instructions, but most CPUs contain instructions that allow you to jump all over the place of your program. Imagine we would be jumping thousand instructions ahead or backwards and do that multiple times throughout our entire program, which is not that uncommon. Now every single time you would be adding a new instruction somewhere in your program, you would have to make sure that every single jump is correct. This would be an almost impossible task and most likely would result in bugs in our program. Which is why assemblers have the ability to specify labels for these kinds of situations. Let's say I want to make sure that the jump instruction in our example always jumps back to the decrement instruction, no matter how many instructions I add in between the decrement and the jump. I could then specify a label before the decrement instruction, like so. I named this label foo, but you could give it any name you'd like. Then instead of passing a 1 as the operand for the JBNZ instruction, I pass in the label name foo. The assembler will now substitute foo with the correct number of instructions JBNZ needs to jump back to. So in the initial example, foo would be replaced with 1 in the final bytecode. If I now add two more instructions, the assembler would replace foo with the number 3 instead. 
This is a huge help when it comes to reading and writing assembly code. Another thing that is common for most assemblers are assembler directives. Assembler directives are special instructions that can instruct the assembler, not the CPU, to do certain things. For example, some CPUs might need the code to start at a certain location in memory, which can be defined with an assembler directive. In our imaginary assembly language, this would be .start. The assembler would then put any code after the start directive into the correct location in memory, where the CPU would start execution. Or another directive could be used to embed data into our program. Let's say our program contains a hard-coded string such as hello world, which we would like to use for some CPU instructions. We could then embed it into the final bytecode with the dot data directive. Or if we want to split our assembly program into multiple source files, we could have a dot include directive that copies the contents of one source file into the current source file, similar to the include statement in C or C++ for example. The directives vary based on the assembler you are using and could do all sorts of complex things. But in general, the things I mentioned are the most basic functionality an assembler can provide. They provide a human readable representation for CPU instructions and they are able to calculate address offsets for the final bytecode. I would also like to stress that the assembly program language is not a general programming language that works for any CPU. Assembly is tightly coupled to the CPU instructions of a specific instruction set architecture. So really, there are as many assembly languages as there are CPU architectures. And even then, there could be different assembly syntax depending on the assembler you are using. So it is pretty much impossible to write portable programs in assembly. So why even use assembly and not a programming language like C or Rust? Sometimes a device might not have an implementation of a higher level programming language, so the only real option there is to use assembly. Another use case for assembly is concise and small code, which will result in greater speed. Even though compilers nowadays are very good at generating fast code, sometimes handwritten assembly can still give you a slight boost over it. Some of the code in today's kernels, or even some of the code in the standard libraries of some programming languages, is still written in assembly. Another use case for assembly is when trying to make changes to a program you do not have the original source code to. Because assembly is just a human readable representation of CPU instructions, you can reverse the process with something that is called a disassembler. A disassembler will take the bit encoded CPU instructions and translate them into assembly code for us. This way, we can now figure out what the program is doing and potentially make changes to it. This is essentially how some modders are able to provide mods and fixes for a video game that doesn't support mods out of the box. And of course, this is also a way to circumvent copy protection mechanisms of software. It is by no means an easy thing to do, but knowing assembly really opens up a lot of possibilities and freedoms. I hope this video gave you an insight into what assembly is and what problems it tried to solve. I'm currently writing my own assembler for the Game Boy in C just to learn how these things work under the hood. And I'm also live streaming the process on Twitch, so please feel free to join me if you are interested in this sort of thing. I will also open up the source code for the assembler to subscribers on Patreon and Ko-fi, so please check out those sites if you are interested in that. I will also make detailed YouTube videos on all the different components that are needed to write your own assembler, so please make sure you are subscribed to this channel so you do not miss any of the videos. Oh, and as a quick side note, I will no longer try to release a new YouTube video every week on Friday. I like making detailed videos and the whole process of writing, recording, editing and making the slides takes a lot of time. And I much rather have an end result that I'm proud of as opposed to releasing something half assed just to make an arbitrary deadline. So with that in mind, thank you for watching and I see you next time, whenever that might be. Bye. while ARM 164 base chips <laughs> and as a programmer you would have to remember all of it program <laughs>